So thank you so much for inviting me to talk today about this subject matter, which has become very near and dear to my heart because it has taken over my life for about the last two years. Um, so before I get started, um, I think it was Roxy Beck yesterday from the Center of Food Integrity talked about um, um, how you relate to, to someone, how you trust them. And so as a government scientist, apparently I'm competent, but I also want to declare that I am also a mother of three boys. I run to work because I care about the environment, so you must trust me as well. And I say that because I forgot to put a disclosure statement in my presentation, so trust me. <laughs> I have nothing to disclose. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to go back and reflect a little bit on um, the definition of an adverse effect that Joe had put up with that um, for us earlier. And, you know, when you look at some of those pieces of that definition, biochemical and physiological responses that lead to structural or functional alterations, um, they can arise at any stage of growth, development, and life. They can be permanent or reversible. Um, reductions in the capacity of an organism to respond to additional insults. When we talk about adverse effects, I think we really often focus on the more toxicological perspective. But when you think about it, chronic diseases can be described as encompassing any or all of these um, definitions, but we haven't really considered it, and I think really because it's difficult to consider. And my job up here today is to show you why it's been difficult to consider chronic diseases, especially in terms of setting uh, dietary reference intakes. So, um, as Linda really nicely laid out, we have a, a current DRI framework, and for the uh, purpose of my talk, I'm going to call this the classic DRI framework. And so the purpose of the dietary reference in intakes is to set values for intakes for apparently healthy populations. So this is the general population, not clinical populations. And it's really setting values that relate nutrient in intakes with indicators of adequacy, um, as well as with intakes of adverse effects associated with high intakes of particular nutrients. But as Linda nicely po pointed out, um, in the 1994 framework, it was explicit in there that where you have sufficient data to show efficacy and safety, you should really consider chronic disease risk reduction and chronic disease endpoints when setting those values. And that is a lofty goal, and I think from a public health perspective, very important. Um, however, when you go to approach the setting of dietary reference intakes, as Linda put out, there's a number of assumptions that have been used when you're setting out your EAR and RDA and the upper tolerable level in order to get this U-shaped risk curve that we, in nutrition, I think we know very well. So what happened was that that framework worked really well when you're looking at low end of intakes and setting adequate intake levels. It worked relatively well, I think, for setting upper tolerable level intake levels as well. Um, but when, for the few cases where um, this framework was applied to chronic disease risk reduction, it really didn't quite fit. And it ended up being really hard, harder than I think anybody had anticipated. And I think it's because a lot of the assumptions used for setting those values just don't really apply or not apply very well to chronic disease endpoints. So what my job is now is to show you some examples of where some assumptions for developing dietary reference intakes um, in the classic sense just don't or didn't really apply to chronic disease endpoints. So here's some assumptions that have been made or some data requirements that were, were set when looking at um, those classic uh, framework. So we um, have a, an approach that depends on the essentiality of the substance. So it was looking at essential nutrients. We had relevant populations that were known. Um, there's an assumption that there was a threshold for adequacy and there was a threshold for upper tolerable intake levels. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions when we're applying that U-shaped risk curve. And then, of course, the nature of the evidence that's used for setting those values um, for adequacy and for those upper tolerable levels um, is very different than what the data is available when looking at chronic disease endpoints. 
And so because these assumptions don't always apply to chronic disease endpoints, this is why it ended up being very difficult. So the first assumption that I want to talk about is the relevant population. So when you look at the dietary reference intakes, it's for the, all of the general healthy population. It's all persons at all life stages. And you're assuming at the low end of the intake, when you're looking at diseases of deficiency, that 100% of the population will be affected by inadequate intakes at some level. And so the example I give, have given here is um, you need vitamin D to maintain bone health. And it doesn't matter if you're a child or an adult, the endpoints might be slightly different, but vitamin D is required for your bone health. Now, when you apply that in the chronic disease um, world, not all persons and not all life stage groups are going to be at risk for developing a chronic disease. And I've given an example here of diabetes prevalence in Canada, of course, because I have to be fair to the Canadians. Um, and basically what you see is that at younger ages, diabetes is very rare, and it increases with age. But it's never 100% of the population, and it's, always, it's also not ever 0% of the population. But you often have significantly less than 50% of the population who is at risk of developing any given chronic disease. So the next assumption is this idea of a threshold for adequacy. So in this model, there's an assumption that as intakes increase, your risk for inadequate intakes is decreased. And at some point, you'll reach an adequate level, and it will be a safe level. And there's this inflection point between the two. There's also a threshold model at the upper intake. It's assumed that at a certain level of intake towards the higher end, you will start to observe adverse effects. And so again, you have this threshold effect. However, that doesn't always hold true when you're looking at chronic disease endpoints. And so they often either lack an inflection point or the inflection point is at some, within some range that is not attainable um, through you know, a normal healthy diet. And so the example I have here is looking at the relationship between the intake of saturated fats and LDL cholesterol, which was used as a surrogate marker for cardiovascular disease. And what you see is that at any level of intake of sat fat, you have a linear relationship with LDL cholesterol. And so your risk is increasing in a linear fashion. It should also be noted that sat fats, um, although we all consume them and they are rather delicious, they have no benefit. Um, so they, they ended up having a recommendation for sat fats that was um, the intake should be as low as you can while maintaining um, adequate intakes for all of your other essential nutrients. So that's where some of the creativity, I think, came in that Linda was talking about. The other assumption is when you look at this classic picture of that uh, U-shaped curve for risk is that you have risk for the adverse effect, the diseases of deficiency at the low intakes, you have risk for adverse effects at the high intakes, but you have some interval of safe intake in between. That doesn't always hold when you're looking at chronic disease endpoints. You may have overlap between where you have harm and where you have benefit. The example that I'm giving here is looking at the relationship between sodium intakes and blood pressure. Um, blood pressure being, again, a, a surrogate marker for um, cardiovascular disease. And what we, we do know that sodium is an essential nutrient, but the level of intake to meet our essential requirements is probably so low that you would never achieve it in a normal, healthy dietary pattern. It would always be higher than that. So what they looked at um, when there's a number of studies looking at uh, control diets versus DASH diets, the low-sodium diets. And what they found was that when you're looking at what's considered a normal, healthy dietary pattern of intake, you have a linear range, a linear relationship between sodium and blood pressure at any of those ranges. And so you don't have that upper threshold that allows you to set the upper tolerable intake level. 
And so your AI, the adequate intake, which is our second best value, um, was based on adequacy for other nutrients. So from your diet, you, ha you have to have a certain amount of your essential nutrients. And so what's the sodium amount in that dietary pattern um, combined with sweat losses? And they based the AI on those two, um, uh, I guess, characteristics. And so then they set the upper tolerable intake level as the next higher dose because of this linear relationship that has no threshold. So again, some creative judgment had to happen. Now looking at the ev evidence that is used to set EARs and ULs, um, first and foremost, you need to establish causality between the nutrient and whatever your endpoint is. And then once you have causality, you need to be able to establish a dose response. And so ideally, when you look at an evidence pyramid, you want that evidence to be at the top end of your pyramid. So these are your um, randomized clinical trials, your intervention studies, um, and if you have it, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. You also, in order to uh, establish a dose response, you need uh, studies with three doses in order to do that. And so this is what most of our um, DRIs are actually, the kind of data that DRIs are based on. Now, when you consider um, our literature um, looking at relationships between nutrients and chronic diseases, you see that most of the evidence is lower on this pyramid. Um, and so it's mostly observational, it's mostly associational. And so this begs the question, if this is the kind of data you have, how do you prove causality? And also, how do you show a dose-response relationship? So these are some challenges that, you know, when you take that classic framework, it just doesn't quite apply to what we actually have um, in terms of the, the evidence available linking nutrients and chronic diseases. The nature of the available evidence also impacts some other very important points. So it impacts the nature of the risk, it, how we express the risk. When we think about a disease of deficiency, there is an absolute risk. You have too low intake, you will get the disease. Um, however, when we consider uh, the evidence looking at the relationship between nutrients and chronic diseases, it comes out as relative risk. The framework wasn't designed to incorporate that. We also want to consider the biomarkers or indicators of disease that are used to establish the relationship. So again, with diseases of deficiency and often when you're setting the upper tolerable level, um, you have direct observation of the clinical outcome. But when we're looking at um, the literature, uh, looking at the links between nutrient intake and chronic diseases, um, it's often you have surrogate endpoints or intermediate outcomes that are being used as surrogates for that clinical outcome, but you're not actually seeing that direct um, observation. We also know that um, the kind of evidence, the observational data um, that's out there, it has inherent errors, and it has inherent unknowns associated with the kind of study that it is. And so you have a whole host of confounding fact, um, factors. Um, there's selection bias. We had that nice presentation from Amy Subar yesterday looking at limitations of self-reported intake. Um, and that's all wrapped up into what the available evidence is in terms of nutrients and chronic disease. And then, of course, we have chronic diseases, which are not a single factorial disease. They are multifactorial. So how do you bring that all together um, when we're trying to set uh, reference intake values? So I'll give you a few examples of these as well, and then I'll wrap up from there. So in terms of the nature of the risk, going back to this idea of absolute risk. So um, when we're looking at the classic approach, setting the EAR and um, setting the um, UL, uh, we know that at low enough intake or high enough intake, you have zero to 100% risk of those adverse effects. Um, but for the chronic diseases, it's going to be defined as relative risk. So no one in a population is at zero or 100% risk because you never have that absolute baseline. You have a relative baseline. Everything is compared to the risk of a particular uh, control group, let's say. 
And so you have a baseline risk, and then from that baseline risk, you have either lower or higher risk, but it's never 100% or 0%. Also, the effect modification from a single nutrient on a multifactorial chronic disease is probably very small, 10%, 5%. So how do you tease that out when you have all of these other confounding factors? Um, and is that 5% effect modification of public health importance. I think there's some judgment that will need to be used. And you also have to consider that the, it's intake levels at the tails of the distributions that are going to have the biggest effect. So it's gonna be the highest intake and the lowest intake because of the nature of the evidence. And an example of this was fiber. So this kind of data was used to set an adequate intake for fiber um, based on risk for coronary heart disease. And you can see that um, you have basically a linear relationship with risk, but it's relative risk. And so when they set the AI, they set it based on um, intake to achieve the lowest relative heart, coronary heart disease risk. But could other levels um, of risk reduction actually be acceptable. Again, these would be judgment calls. And then with the biomarkers, uh, looking at um, inadequate intakes and adverse effects associated with high intakes, those are direct observational data, direct data, um, looking at this is your exposure and here's your outcomes. And we often will have indicators of status and those indicators are on the causal pathway um, to the adverse clinical outcome. But when you look at um, the evidence supporting a link between a nutrient and a chronic disease, it's less straightforward. So you very rarely have direct observation of the exposure and the clinical outcome, and instead you're using either valid surrogate outcomes or a lot of cases, what's being reported are non-validated intermediate outcomes that are likely to be associated with the clinical outcome, but there's some ambiguity there. So the key takeaways from this is that the classic DRI approach has worked well for establishing um, adequate intakes um, and safe intakes for essential nutrients, but it hasn't always worked well when considering chronic disease endpoints. And this is because the nature of chronic disease means that the assumptions that are used to define the EAR and the UL just don't always apply. And we also have the difference in terms of the nature of the available evidence. Um, it's significantly different between chronic disease studies um, and those um, establishing essentiality and toxicity. So what do we do? Throw the baby out with the bathwater? Do we stick with the old framework and keep trying to fit chronic disease endpoints into something that doesn't quite fit it? Do we just get rid of chronic disease endpoints in terms of setting DRI values? Or do we look for new ways? Um, and so, as Chris mentioned, in last spring, uh, we, um, the U.S. and Canadian DRI steering committees um, had a workshop. We hosted a workshop um, where we had um, a panel of experts from a diverse array of backgrounds. And we have some of those people I think are in the audience. Joe is here, and I saw Stephanie Atkinson yesterday, so she's here too. But basically we had people coming from a lot of DRI history to no DRI history. We had toxicologists, statisticians, uh, nutrition um, experts, um, DRI users, people who hardly ever even heard of a DRI, um, come together. Um, to start to both critically evaluate some of these key issues that are limiting our use of chronic disease endpoints and setting DRI values, but also to provide options for how we can actually incorporate them into the future. Um, and this may require um, either changing or developing a new framework. And so, um, as Chris referred to, the report is being finalized um, over the next few weeks, and we are hoping to have it published in the very near future. So I'll end there on a positive note. There's hope. <laughs> so, and uh, I guess we'll have the panel now, or? <laughs>